Well, I'm super honored to be an ambassador. Before I begin my talk, a lot of you are probably wondering about this very cool hat that I have. This hat is made from a polypore mushroom. This is called the Amadou mushroom, and it's made by some ladies in Transylvania. And this mushroom is very important because there's no doubt that we all migrated from Africa around 200,000 years ago. This mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. You can drill this mushroom out, put embers of fire inside, and carry fire for days. It also is, in my research, the first mushroom known to have an antiviral substance, active against tobacco viruses. Now, the path of knowledge that I walk is not traveled by many, but by some. And the day that I received this award, my older brother John, who's been my mentor, I got very excited and I emailed him that morning. Well, that was the day my brother John died from cardiac arrest. He never got the email. And so John had a characteristic that was really important, that was very helpful to me. He was a very kind person. And the other individuals who were greatly influential in my life one of whom is here today is Dr. Michael Bug, Dr. Alexander Smith, Dr. Daniel Stuntz, and Kit Skates. These are kind people, kind scientists, and I think that's really important for mentorship. Um, Michael and I spent a lot of time in the old growth forest. That's where a lot of these mushrooms grow. But many of you may not know, we only have 10 to 15 percent of the wood debris native to the forest today. Where'd that carbon go? I think you can imagine. It has a dramatic impact upon the ecosystem. Most of the mushroom fungi that I grow are decomposers. They create soil. So we have wood chips, we grow mycelium. Ultimately, they're the soil magicians of nature. And the mycelial lenses that are out there in nature um, can be seen. And they oftentimes come to the very surface. So this is what the mycelium looks like. And Michael and I, when we would go on adventures with Alexander Smith, Kit Skates, and Daniel Stunts, we were fascinated that we'd find some mushrooms that would grow specifically around ant mounds. And so this is a Lepiota mushroom, and we thought that was interesting, but little did we know until years later, published in Science uh, Daily, that the ants were cultivating these mushrooms as, a, mo as a, a means of host defense, of resistance against invasive pathogens. So I got real excited because I culture about 500 uh, species in my laboratories. So I cultured some of this Lepiota mycelium, the parasol mushroom. I got to a thatch ant mound, a smaller one. I mixed in the mycelium. The ants moved it around. Uh, and then I thought that was interesting. And then one year later, boing, some giant mushrooms popped up. This is my grandson, Trevon. Um, and so that was fun, that worked one year, and then we go to, every year thereafter, more mushrooms will come up. So here's it's aptly named the parasol mushroom because it's so large. Well, that was fun, and then the mushrooms started being spread around by ants, and they were incorporated into their nests, and so more mushrooms would come up. And these mushrooms can be very large, about a foot tall. And so here's one day, the next day, the next day, and Paul has a beer and reads the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> So, co-evolution with, with mushrooms and beer and, uh, and knowledge. Well, the mushrooms then spread, and we had hundreds of these coming up. The employees would spread them. Thatch, more thatch hands, uh, mounds would be inoculated. But let's go back to the mycelium, something that I grow a lot of. The mycelium is this white fuzzy stuff, and, um, and this can be triggered into mushroom formation. Mushrooms are very ephemeral. They're in their viewscape for a limited amount of time. That's why mushrooms are so mysterious. You have the experiential viewscape of plants and animals that go on for months, years. Mushrooms are up and gone so quickly. They can feed you, they can kill you, they can heal, heal you, they can get you high. And something that's so potent and powerful, but so temporary in your viewscape is naturally um, avoided because they could be dangerous. Well, one of the mushrooms that we were growing is a garden giant mushroom, a massive mushroom. Um, and I had a small garden giant patch uh, in my garden one year. And I was in my garden, and I was like amazed that I had beehives. And for 40 days, from sunrise to sunset, bees would come directly into my garden giant patch, move the wood chips away, and start sipping on the mycelium. Now, that was really curious to me. Why was it doing that? I published this in 1987. Virtually nobody noticed. OK, keep that story in mind, and we'll move forward. This is where I live. And this was, used to be all old growth forests 120 years ago. They cut down the old growth forests, um, and this is the house that, I, that was built in 1904, remodeled in 1972. Um, and the house was 
rotting, the floorboards, the house was incredibly porous. I had 15 buckets catching rainwater. When the wind blew, it would slow down. <laughs> um, and the floorboards were myceliated from a woodcock mushroom that's growing on a stump, the remnants of the old growth forest. It softened the wood, and then it attracted carpenter ants. Now, and so I had this ritual. I have two strange skill sets. I can repair, repair vacuum cleaners, um, and I love washing dishes. Um, and this is my habit. This is why I, I grew up. And so I would be, you know, waking up in the morning, have my espresso, look down, there's a pile of sawdust from the carpenter ants overnight munching on the house. Well, this happened one day, two days, 100 days, 200 days later, and I'm just like, oh, my whole house is starting to fall, fall down. So I went to the environmental protection um, homepage, and I looked up a mushroom, a fungus, that the EPA was very proactive on and recommending. And it's called metarhizium. When well, I ordered cultures of this, unbeknownst to me, it was a mold culture. We have very extensive large laboratories. We have spore-free environments. But when I got the cultures and I plated them out, I, was, I didn't want spores in my laboratory. And then I plated them out and I saw these white wedges. What are these white wedges? I looked at the scientific literature and literally hundreds of mycologists have worked on this. I mean, the biopesticide industry spent tens of millions of dollars to try to use this fungus to be able to treat houses, to, uh, uh, preventing them from being consumed by termites, carpenter ants, etc. And I looked up the white wedges and all the scientists said, oh, senescence, losing the ability to reproduce. The cultures will die out, and they indeed will. But their, their path was more spores, more missiles, more death. And I chose, well, I don't want spores in my laboratory, so I chased this little sector and I turned this culture into this one. It's non-toxic to bees, non-toxic to birds, to humans. It's been recently approved um, for food handling facilities. So I morphed that culture into a pre-sporulating state and created this white mycelium on grain inside of one of our laboratories. Well, then I inspired my daughter in, in science, and I said, we're going to trick the carpenter ants. Now, this is really important because what happened uh, with the biopesticide industry, because of the spore repellency property, when any worker comes back with any of these mold spores on it, two guards at the entry of the nest will capture that worker, take that worker to a graveyard, cut off its head, and the two workers then commit suicide. They want to protect the queen from infection at all costs. These are called social insects, and they're oftentimes called factory fortresses. So I then, here I am, I, there's a, you can't really see it, but there's Douglas fir needles, there's mold, this is my daughter. And so I was looking, well, what can I have as a delivery system here to put down for the carpenter ants? So I pushed my daughter, and she had a Barbie doll set. So I said, oh, can I have your Barbie doll dish? So this is what we did. We put us down you know, around 9 o'clock at night in the summertime, and then we went to bed. Fortunately, my daughter, she woke up around 1 or 2 in the morning, and she diverted her path to go to that look at that Barbie doll dish, and she could not believe what she saw. She ran into our room saying, Dad, Dusty, wake up. You've got to see this. And we went over to the Barbie doll dish, and this is basically what we saw. The ants were swarming upon the mycelium on grain, and we watched the little ants take the grain kernels back into their house. Now, had she not done that, I had mice in the house. I would not have known that this actually worked. So we fast forward to a week later. I'm making my espresso. I go over to vacuum. There's no sawdust piles. It frankly was disturbing. It rained on my parade. You know, what do I do? You know, I had this habit of going on for hundreds of days. Well, in fact, the, we found out that the uh, workers would bring back the mycelium, they give it to the queen, the queen disperse it throughout the nest, and then, woof, the whole nest would be destroyed. So I got rid of the carpenter ants in my house. And then my aunt Louise, <laughs> um, she said, oh, Paul, I heard you got rid of carpenter ants. Can you help the family farmhouse? It's being destroyed by carpenter ants. I said, Louise, oh, OK, I'll go ahead and try. I did the same thing. And I can't believe I have this recording. And this is a recording that she, my Aunt Louise left. She's 93 years of age. This is Louise calling at noon on Wednesday. I'm very excited to tell you that the ants are all gone. I came down Sunday morning, and on the rug below the toilet was a huge circle of black ants. And they were all acting very strange, and they weren't running anywhere. And among the ants was a very large black ant that I figured must have been the queen. So I thought, oh, what will I do? So I picked the carpet up and shook all those ants into the toilet and flushed it. And now they're gone. And I've only seen one other ant that was incapacitated, and he was kind of going crazy, trying to walk out on the front porch. So I stepped on him and finished him. But I had not seen any ants anywhere out on this cement deck. 
And then, to my utter surprise, boing, a cordyceps mushroom can spring out of the ants. Well, the house went down, okay? And then I told a friend of mine, he says, I think you have a patent. You've overcome the spore repellency property that defeated the biopesticide industry. My first patent issued uh, against carpenter ants, fire ants, and termites. We then developed bait stations. Then we then used these bait stations with Dr. Laurel Hansen at Spokane University, and we found that indeed we can cause mortality of car carpenter ants. And then we thought, well, we have the mycelium, let's do an extract of it. So we made extracts, and in the four choices here, the termites preferentially would tunnel specifically to where the extracts were. And then we did a phago stimulation uh, uh, test, and we wondered, well, is the extract potent enough? Maybe we should dilute it. And when we diluted it 500 to 1 with water, it potentized the extract. It became more potent. Dilution is a solution to profitability. <laughs> so then we, okay, and then the patent office, you know, they said, okay, you've proved it with multiple social insects. So they gave me all social insects without restriction to species. Well, I thought, okay, well, let's try some more experiments. And because of Michael's uh, being a chemist, I got tuned into the fact the mycelium is, in these exudates is producing cal uh, oxalic acid. And the oxalic acid pulls the calcium out of the exoskeleton of ticks, mites, all sorts of insects that we tried against bed bugs, like Sherman tanks. Bam! 95% of them are killed in five days, the residuals. In another five days, they're killed. Then we tried it against uh, forehead flies and fungus gnats and flies uh, over and over. And then, uh, the patent office uh, just recently um, gave, gave me uh, another extract of uh, all uh, insects without restrictions to species, uh, potentially over six million species. I think I found something that is absolutely critical that could be paradigm shifting. And so I'm really happy that I decided, well, if I can control the migration of insects, social and non-social, I can control the diseases they, they vector. So this patent was just approved on, on June 17th, just uh, two weeks ago. Um, and then I thought, um, well, this is very interesting. And then a friend of mine, Louis Schwartzberg, a filmmaker, said, Paul, the bees are really in trouble. Can't you do something for the bees? I thought, well, you know, I had this ex strange experience with bees in my garden. And so I started looking at colony collapse disorder. Now, President uh, Obama came out with a very nice uh, memorandum on Friday. The bees are suffering from lack of habitats, lack of wood, uh, potentially, parasites, especially mites, mites that vector viruses, genetic diversity and exposure to uh, pesticides, especially neonicotinoids. This is a huge problem. We have 12,500,000 beehives in this country, and we're losing 30% of those beehives per year. This is a threat to biosecurity, both food as well as political and economic security. So, okay, hmm, okay, Louis, I'll look into that. And then my wife and I were hiking in the old growth forest in the South Fork of the Ho in the Olympic Peninsula. I found this bear, bear uh, strike. It's the best photograph of a bear strike I've ever seen. Bam! A bear tore down the tree. Bees would have attracted to the resin. Well, we scientists knew that. And then I decided to come back three years later, and I, we found the bear strike. Um, and um, they would introduce a mushroom called the red belt of polypore that caused the logs to rot, where the bees would then come inside and nest. Um, and so this was really interesting to us because it also breaks down DDT. And then a related species called agaricon um, has very strong antiviral activities. And I'm very happy Paul and I today both received a new patent. This is a patent that, that was just issued this morning um, when I work with the BioShield program, uh, active against a wide variety of viruses, including H5N1. We're sending it in for testing against Ebola. And so, okay. And so where do we go from here? So I decided, well, maybe I can make the, an extract. And I, we created myco honey, a nutraceutical that is solely made from mushroom mycelium that's rich in all these sugars. And so we started working then with Dr. Steve Shepard at Washington State University on stress tests. And this is um, part of the test inside his laboratory, longevity test. All the bees typically die within 30 days. And then we surveyed about 20 species of fungi. And here we go. Here's the control. Here is the, again, 1% uh, or 10% to 0.1%, 100% dilution. Dilution is a solution to profitability. We have found something that extends longevity. We plan to go into hundreds of hives in this, in the, over the winter, and so we should have some good results, or hopefully results next summer. And so we decided, okay, we have this host defense product line that's sold in Whole Foods and vitamin shop all over, and so I thought I'm gonna rebrand this now, and I'm coming up with a bee-friendly logo. So when people buy our product, we support research in host defense. 
um, and, and, and preventing bees from colony collapse disorder. So I invite you to walk with me on this path of knowledge, and I just want to end with a film that Louis Schwartzberg and I are making, and I think it sums up a lot of our views that we share in common. Mushroom mycelium represents rebirth, rejuvenation, regeneration. Fungi generate soil that gives life. The task that we face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of the fungal networks that communicate with the ecosystem. And I believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy for communication. If we don't get our act together and come in commonality and understanding with the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? If I die trying, and, but I'm inadequate to the task to make a course change in the evolution of life on this planet, okay, I tried. The fact is, I tried. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept, it is a spirit. And so hopefully the spirit of goodness will survive.